After man first stood on his own two feet, it took millions of years before he took up the tools of his supremacy on Earth. Our breakthrough came about two and a half million years ago, and ever since, we thought animals were incapable of using or making tools like us. We were wrong. What do animals use tools for? And how do you define a tool? Is it merely an object detached from their body? Or could a tool be an extension of the body? Even a substance secreted by the body, and perish the thought, could another living organism be used as a tool? Scientists categorise the toolkit of the animal kingdom in every one of these ways. Where some are born with the innate gift of using a tool, others are copycats, and a few use high intelligence to make tools for themselves. The survival of the species was forged in the long process we call evolution. Over millions of years, creatures evolved unique ways to adapt to climate change, new environments and new predators. Some were blessed with special organs designed to give them a fighting chance. The forests of Madagascar conceal an animal with such a bizarre gift that many natives consider it an omen. The eye eye works at night, shunned or killed on sight by some, revered as an ancestral spirit by others. In actual fact, the eye eye is a kind of lemur that evolution blessed with a bony third finger that it uses to cast about for what it loves best, coconuts and larvae. E.T. Eat your heart out. The eye eye's special tool can be twisted in any direction thanks to a ball and socket joint in each of its hands. It's perfectly adapted to the task. The eye eye is a rare sight. Like many animals in Madagascar, it's been hunted to the brink of extinction. Tapping the bark and listening, it divines the location of larvae inside a tree. The tool of the endangered eye eye is one of evolution's more remarkable appendages. Evolution spins quite a different yarn with the bodily functions of insects in the tropics of Australia. The web spinner lives in a protective chamber of pure silk, constructed beneath stones and among moss and litter on the ground. The tools on display here are the creature's front legs, which excrete silk from glands. Fine hairs on these glands comb the silk into shape. The plasterer and his trowel find suitable expression in the rainforests of Australia.
Where do creatures spin silk underwater? And how does silk become a tool itself in nature's seemingly infinite arsenal of survival? This aquatic larva lives in streams. It will soon leave the water to metamorphose into a flying insect. First, it must feed sufficiently before making the switch to land. To do so, it weaves a net from its own silk, this time not for protection, but hunting. Plant stems provide perfect pillars to support this intricate structure. The mouth of the net opens up to gentle currents which carry microorganisms into the trap. Trawling in this way for nutrients ensures the larva will soon spread its wings on dry land as a caddis fly. Such external tools, those detached from an animal's body, encompass living beings. Clownfish use poisonous sea anemones as shields. They hide behind these tentacles, immune to the poison and protected from predators. But this is not selfish exploitation of another life. The anemone feeds off the clownfish's waste, so they share a mutual dependence on one another. The tiny boxer crab would seem an unlikely vehicle for war against far larger species. Like the clownfish, it too has found the perfect weapon, the perfect tool for survival in life itself. A more practical kind of anemone accompanies the crab wherever it goes and also gets fed along the way. From the depths of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the boxer crab wields the marine equivalent of a human shield. It's easily provoked. Sparring with a friend is good practice for meeting the enemy. Now, will the boxer crab retreat in keeping with its size? Stalemate? Not a bit. Two arms against eight and still it's back for more. Size isn't everything when you choose the right weapon. Likewise, on land, the smallest creatures can have a big impact on the environment, especially when they work together. Cooperation and strength in numbers assume epic proportions among the green ants of Australia. But their secret does not merely lie in their slave-like devotion to labour, they too rely on a living tool. Green ants build nests in trees. To bend nature to their own specification requires huge collective muscle and coordination. But how will the nest keep its shape? With a tool born from the ant's own flesh and blood. To sew these giant leaves together into a durable structure, the ants exploit their own silk-producing larvae. 
While one party presses leaves together, the others shuttle back and forth, directing the larvae to secrete silk at the right spot. A tender squeeze of their mandibles here, and a pat from their antennae there. Within hours, the nest is theirs. The living tools animals use extend far beyond the insect world and can touch a raw nerve in every one of us. Scientists take a broad view of the use animals make of biological tools, far removed from the purely mechanical exercise of building ant nests. In descending evolutionary order, primates show off skills in tool use that put most other animals in the shade. They use their own species for social ends. The Rock of Gibraltar is home to an old colony of Barbary macaques. Disputes between males flare up at a moment's notice. Social skills and what some scientists describe as social tools diffuse conflicts. This male isn't out to protect his offspring. He's using the baby to resolve a dispute. The act of presenting the baby to an adversary immediately calms an otherwise volatile situation. The young instill peace, on the surface at least. Peaceful rural settings sometimes mask the horrors of survival in the wild. Expect no social graces from whatever animal did this. Meet the red-backed shrike. Its scientific name is Lanius, meaning butcher. The butcher bird winters in Africa. When it returns to nest in Europe, the countryside just isn't the same anymore. Like many birds, its appetite for rodents and insects is huge, and there are young mouths to feed too. Any butcher's hook will do to make a larder for stockpiling, especially when summer rains make hunting a pain. Impaling rodents, dead or alive, on thorns or barbed wire serves a second most practical purpose. Spikes help tear prey apart and get to the very best morsels. And the butcher bird is very picky. Not to put too fine a point on it, the butcher's spike is a fine tool in the stakes of survival. So handsome and yet so ruthless in its choice of tools. Though stakes help the butcher bird's enterprise, can they really be considered proper tools? Frédéric Julien of the School of Social Sciences in Paris joins the debate. Here, the particular thing about the tool is that it's immobile. And that's why a number of psychologists have described this as proto-tool use. It's not mobile, so we can't really call it a tool. But the psychologists who first used the idea of proto-tool use imbued it with an evolutionary linear concept of tools. Nowadays, we've moved beyond this idea. We don't really believe it anymore, and we know that for some animal species, including birds, there is a wide range of different tool usage, sometimes very complicated. 
If the butcher bird scores no points for not using mobile technology, you might expect superior birds of prey to fare much better, both in captivity and in the wild. Henri Venon has practised falconry in the French Pyrenees for 15 years. One of his star performers is an Egyptian vulture. The vulture's imposing physique is matched by a cunning sense of purpose when it comes to using loose objects as tools. This bird can be seen in France after the beginning of March, when it comes to reproduce. It leaves at the end of September and flies to Africa for the winter. Ornithologists over there were surprised to find that this bird has an unusual quality in that it uses tools. It uses stones as tools. It uses them to break ostrich eggs. It's the only bird of prey that uses tools. That's using the narrower definition of tools, those that are manipulable. So, how do we crack this problem? Easy. Oh dear, it'll come. This one was born here in captivity at Donjon des Aigles more than seven years ago, and we've been able to observe its behaviour naturally, instinctively, when we gave it an ostrich egg or an imitation egg. The bird got to work straight away. We didn't need to teach it. It's an innate characteristic in the bird, which it reproduces just as its relatives do in the wild. This time, the vulture has a choice. The vulture hammers home the point that only one stone fits the task, and it displaces itself to find the magic bullet. Biologists in Kenya have seen them search far further than a stone's throw away to locate the right size and shape. But their sense of discrimination doesn't end here. This is the Egyptian vulture that you just saw using tools to break ostrich eggs. This innate behaviour isn't used on all eggs because we've seen that with hen's eggs it can use a different technique. It works out whether it needs a tool or not and how it's going to use it. So I'm going to put a hen's egg down and you'll see the difference in size. Now we'll put the vulture down and see how he behaves. Stone throwing is an innate behaviour, something that's acquired through evolution. And yet the vulture judges wisely not to take a sledgehammer to a hen's egg. Scientists speculate that the first primitive act of breaking an egg on the ground could well have led to throwing stones against tougher shells. That begs the question whether the use of tools by animals involves actual brain power and rational thought, as we might like to believe. To hazard an answer, we return to the world of insects, where brain power is down to a few cerebral glands. Ants are genetically programmed to behave the way they do. All the bytes of information contained in their genes were acquired over a long period of time. 
So faced with a tasty carcass, most species would simply break it up, form a typical chain gang and haul it piece by piece back to the nest. Or they might ingest the juices first and make as many return journeys from carcass to nest as necessary to feed the colony. Aphenogaster ants in the forests of Vermont behave quite differently. They use bits of plant or tiny balls of earth as sponges to soak up the juices of the carcass before delivery to the colony. Why? Because it means less time exposed to predators. While the ants entrust nature's tools to do the job for them, they themselves scarper. The ants hide until the sponges are saturated. It's not just the larger predators they fear, but other warring ants. So the less time spent on the job, the better. As the sponges absorb far more fluid than any single ant could ingest, they guarantee a good colonial meal and help assure the safety of the species. The forests of Vermont may not be as important to evolutionary science as the plains of Africa, but they do prove one thing. Certified tools appeared in the insect world tens of millions of years before man. Among insects, even an intimidating wasp must use innate ingenuity to protect itself and its offspring. Unlike social wasps that live in swarms, the Ammophilia wasp digs a solitary nest in loose, sandy ground. Its burrow extends only a few centimetres below the surface. Before laying an egg in a chamber at the bottom, the wasp must find a caterpillar to feed its future larvae. That means leaving the nest unattended and risking intrusions while it's away. The entrance must be carefully concealed. With the nest now transformed into a tomb, the work is still not done. The wasp rakes slight sand over the top a perfectionist down to the last grain. Now, where's that caterpillar? That'll do. The ground now swarms with ants and the wasp doesn't want to be caught red-handed. The meticulous work of concealment could prove the wasp's undoing. Ants are quick to mobilise when food signals are sent out. There's not a moment to lose getting the caterpillar down the hatch and sealing the nest once again. With eggs to be laid and larvae to be fed, Survival calls for a final touch of ingenuity. To make the burrow completely burglar-proof, some wasps take security to an even higher level. After blocking off the entrance, it casts about for a useful tool to finish off the job. A wood shaving or bit of gravel comes in handy to flatten down the surface, so any passerby would walk right over without batting so much as a mandible. The promise of new life begins with a burial. If some insects are born to the art of tool use, what if your birthright denies you any such advantage? 
the solitary heron must fend for itself. Its chief asset is patience, but even so, a day out fishing turns into an exercise of hit and miss. Too many misses. Now, watch this. And this. The striated heron on the Caribbean island of Trinidad has reduced the odds against to virtually nil. Looks fishy, you bet. Nothing is left to chance, because that one heron came up with a system. And it all began at this tourist centre, where ducks live in semi-captivity alongside the odd visiting wild heron. The ducks are fed a mixture of bread and cereal, a ritual the heron tired of seeing every morning, perhaps because he noticed those elusive fish also enjoying a free breakfast. Something dawns. But what? Share the duck's breakfast? That would be too easy and far less rewarding than a more cunning plan. Get it? Just turn a duck's breakfast into a heron's lunch. It works a treat. The heron's ability to bait fish has been observed elsewhere in the world, but it's not at all common practice. Though who knows, one day it may pass this ruse on to others in its species. What's more, you don't need a duck's breakfast to get started for the day. The heron also feeds off insects. If fish can be baited with bread, then why not sacrifice the insect? Another well-calculated and intelligent move. The tools of the animal kingdom finally begin to make sense when they're applied thoughtfully. Vast forests of kelp that stretch along the coast of California up to Alaska provide rich hunting grounds for the sea otter. Because of its size, it can weigh 45 kilos, and because it can't store fat, the otter spends much of its time eating. In fact, it eats anything up to a third of its total body weight every day. The diet varies, marine invertebrates, shellfish, sea urchins and sometimes fish. So much time hunting, so much time floating on its back eating. And yet try opening scores of shellfish and sea urchins from the comfort of your armchair. It's not easy and the rewards are mean. The tool the otter uses to prepare its seafood lies on the seabed. It's looking for nothing more simple than a stone. The stone serves as an anvil, strategically positioned on its chest to take the full impact of the shell.
The otter tucks the precious stone under its flipper every time it dives for more food or samples crustaceans from the shore. The repeated use of the same tool denotes forethought, an ability to anticipate future needs, even though the otter is constrained by cack-handedness. Its fingerless little claws limit what it can do. The rule of thumb for really creative tool users lies elsewhere, as we'll soon see. The physical handicaps some animals face in their use of tools evaporate in the misty tropical forests of Africa. Here, primates are endowed with a trusty old opposable thumb that allows them to grasp objects firmly. The shoots of evolutionary growth bless their world. And it all begins here, in the construction of a nest. Every evening, chimpanzees set about building nests in trees, like orangutans and gorillas who do the same on the ground. They pay such close attention to comfort that it's difficult not to see in this ritual the act of making up a bed. It's all down to the right selection of branches, those that don't rudely spring back when the occupants slip into dreamland. Creature comforts in the canopy ensure a peaceful night far from nocturnal predators on the ground. Look at those creative hands at work. But there's symbolic importance here too. The chimps aren't just manipulating objects. The nest, according to some primatologists, was their original tool, the first primitive act that led great apes to greater thoughts, greater ideas, greater physical achievements. It was a crucial event in their evolution, and ultimately, in the evolution of man. Great apes often use the same material to make different sets of tools. Our closest relative in the wild, the bonobo, ekes out a precarious existence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Again, they pay close attention to comfort. Leaves become mattresses to insulate against the damp and protect against insects. And when it comes to personal hygiene, leaves and moss take on very functional uses. Bathroom habits performed with choice accessories. Of all the great apes, none can match the chimpanzee for frequent daily use of tools. The chimpanzee's toolkit lends itself to 19 recorded uses. Chimps are the jack of all trades. They're demonstrative animals, especially the dominant male patrolling his own territory. He must be seen to be in charge. He wields a stick like a policeman's baton as a deterrent and often to intimidate others and command respect. Beyond macho displays, chimps put tools to more subtle uses. 
an extended limb makes up for a short reach to scratch around for food or other curiosities. Tools open up all kinds of culinary delights for chimpanzees, extending the range and variety of their diet. In Tanzania's Mahale National Park, a group has learned to use twigs to lure ants out of holes. Ant fishing, as it's known, carries on all year round, about the only activity that does for chimpanzees. And a twig saves them from being bitten by the ant itself. Not any old twig will do. Chimps adapt the tool for the job. They strip a tender creeper until it's thin and smooth enough to slip into the hole. Thin and tender for the ants to take hold too. Not all chimps practice the technique of ant fishing. Those who do pass the skill on to younger chimps. It'll take years of learning and experience to really get the knack. Not all chimps are equal, and some are certainly less equal than others. Thick-skinned fruits like baobab, so rich in vitamins, and any number of hard nuts provide a litmus test in the study of tool use among chimps. For many, getting to the fruit is a question of trial and error. This technique shows more promise than others. What is the solution? It's getting warmer, but lacks a second implement which other chimps elsewhere already have. Some chimpanzees living in the forests of West Africa cracked the problem with an ingenuity that amazed primatologists like Tetsuru Matsuzawa of the Primate Research Institute in Japan. That is nut cracking. Use a pair of stones to crack open nuts. In this case, you need a set of tools. One is hammer. Another is amber, so two stones are necessary, not a simple object. In this case, it's very difficult because not only the two stones, but also you have to pay attention to the target nut. Thanks to the members of the community, the young in chimpanzees, infants and juveniles had abundant experience of carefully watching what adults do, use a pair of stones to crack open nuts. And three, four, five, six, seven years, now they learn how to use stones to crack open nuts. Otherwise, they cannot uh, do such a thing. Abundant stones are available, so the Bosu chimpanzee has no necessity to carry the stones because wherever the nuts are available, nearby there are lots of stones. I have seen both cases. Chimpanzee transport stones to nuts or chimpanzee collect nuts and transport them to the stones. Both cases, but it's only about five, 10 meters. 
So we are interested in how the skill and knowledge can be transmitted from one generation to the next. I think a sort of education by master apprenticeship is very important. So first, the mother or adults of the community show the right model in the right way using stones properly to crack open nuts. The second point is the infant has a strong motivation, intrinsic motivation, to watch the adult's behavior and to make the copy of the behavior. And the third point is the mother and the adults are very tolerant to the infant, any kind of spontaneous attempt by infant. So that is a core part of my theory of education by master apprenticeship. And what I call education by master apprenticeship is a traditional way of education in Japan and other traditional countries. And then that is a way of education in wild chimpanzees. Professor Matsutsawa's research reveals ever more complex combinations of tools used by these chimps. We have seen chimpanzees use the sand stone as a wedge to adjust the surface level flat. Now the nut is stabilized on the amber stone and that nut can be hit to get the kernel edible part. Okay, in this case, three stones are involved in the nut cracking as a set of tool. The third stone should be the first step to use a tool for another tool. This is a sort of quantum jump from the simple tool use to get a goal because the tool was used for another tool. So such a tool is called meta tool. And so far, the wedge stone used by Bosu chimpanzee in the wild is the single case of the meta tool used by the wild chimpanzees. Frédéric Julien of the School of Social Sciences in Paris studies nutcracking techniques among other chimpanzee populations in West Africa. In Bosu, they use mobile anvils, and they can be used either as anvils or as hammers. And at the Banco site in the Ivory Coast, I was able to see chimpanzees using this as an anvil. You see traces of a hollow which have been used to crack nuts. The chimpanzees would have placed nuts in the hollow to break them. But previously, they had used another side, and we also discovered on this side an indentation. So this anvil had probably been used previously as a hammer. This is what the chimpanzees did. They used this part as a hammer. On a découvert sur l'autre face une cupule d'utilisation. Et donc, cette enclume avait au préalable servi probablement de percuteur et les chimpanzés s'en étaient servis de percuteur. So tools have multiple uses depending on who's using them and where. Let's imagine that we find a particular tool in a prehistoric site. Well, that's exactly what happened to Mary Leakey, a well-known prehistorian in the 1960s who discovered tools like this one in the Olduvai Gorge and dated it back 1,700,000 years ago, 1.8 million years on the site of DK1. The tools were made either by Australopithecus or by Homo habilis. We're not exactly sure. In any case, one of man's ancestors. In fact, this instrument, which is identical, was discovered among chimpanzees in West Africa in the year 2000 during a dig that I was organizing. The analogy is amazing. L'analogie est totale. Les outils sont identiques entre ceux de 2 millions d'années et ceux d'aujourd'hui des chimpanzés. 
These tools are identical, one from two million years ago and the other from modern chimpanzee tools. This means that humans, who were always thought to be uniquely hunters and gatherers, were also consuming fruits and nuts. And what we just found out recently, based on observations made in South Africa, is that they seem to use tools made from bone to open up termite hills and extract termites, in the same way as chimpanzees were doing. This is one of the reasons why, about 20 years ago, I became interested in primates in order to interpret the first human tools, the first behavior of ancient humans. Thumbs up for apes, who laid down a marker in the evolution of tool use. But is it all down to the handy, opposable thumb? There's one other surprising animal that begs to differ in a moment. Where on earth do we find an animal capable of making tools without hands? The forests of New Caledonia in the South Pacific dangle tantalizing bait for just such an animal. The old crow so often maligned by humans, is gifted with uncommon intelligence. Once again, a fat larva, favoured by so many animals, must stay well out of sight if it wants a second life. The cold, damp interior of hollow trees deter most predators, but not the crow. And yet even this notorious thief must go back to the drawing board. It scours the forest for tools. There are plenty at its beck and call. Blame it on the tool. After all, it was just picked off the ground. Far better, one made to measure. go. Simple. The forests of New Caledonia conceal more secrets that the crow keeps close to its chest. Scientists studying several other sites put the crow right up there with the chimpanzee in the order of tool making. The pandanus plant, with its long, spiky leaves, makes an excellent utensil for probing larvae in fallen trees. Cause and effect. The crow exhibits great dexterity. But the effect of the tool reveals less than the original cause. Far from randomly stripping the pandanus, the crow proves to be a precision toolmaker. Incisions along the veins of the leaf ensure the length is correct and that one side is serrated. A young crow faces a steep learning curve if indeed this is a case of apprenticeship. It's difficult to know. Either way, today it's eager to give it a go. It ain't easy, and the parent quickly loses patience. 
but practice makes perfect, and in time the youngster will no doubt learn how to use the tool and how to make it. Now comes craftsmanship on a level never observed elsewhere in the animal kingdom. While all crows in New Caledonia learn how to strip a branch to fashion a probe, this crow is in a league of its own. Instead of a probe, a hook. A quick round of tests and back to the workbench. Not even primates get this far. The crow remains the only animal we know of on the planet that can manufacture such a sophisticated tool. Surely it now deserves respect for hooking our attention on a talent for tool making that mirrors our own. And each to his own. Animals bend nature to their unique specifications. They who use tools transform the world around them. They influence those around them. And they use tools to transform themselves. Such has been our own experience for two and a half million years.